Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Captain Cadell. Thank you for coming to this Modern War Institute event today. We have Professor Schultz here. Uh, he teaches at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Um, he's a professor at international politics. He asked me to keep his introduction short because he will be uh, speaking quite a bit on his theme today, which is military innovation and war. So thank you very much. Um, hold your questions. I ask you to hold your questions till the end. He'll open it up for questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, great to be here. Um, I'm gonna tell you a story. And, uh, and the story is about uh, military innovation in war. And I'm going to argue that in order to innovate, a military organization has to develop or have instilled in it or some way discover uh, characteristics of learning. Uh, and this presentation will be about how one military organization, Task Force 714, learned and uh, innovated in the midst of the Iraq War. So this is um, our way forward. Uh, we're gonna start with the puzzle, what's the problem? Uh, I'm going to outline um, an organizational learning uh, model and then test it uh, against uh, Task Force 714 uh, in Iraq. So the puzzle, um, the puzzle is this, that um, the U.S. Counterterrorism Task Force uh, comes from JSOC. That, uh, that task force uh, in uh, 2003 deployed, or elements of it deployed to Iraq as Task Force 714 was commanded by General Stanley McChrystal. Prior to Iraq, that task force was not built for war. It was built for, and you can see it in my second line there, it was built for periodic, occasional hostage rescue and direct action missions. It was a highly specialized force. I call it a strategic scalpel. It was a strategic scalpel. Once in Iraq, this task force uh, was given a new mission, the original mission uh, changed, it was given a new mission, and that mission was to dismantle Al-Qaeda's secret networked apparatus, or their clandestine underground. Uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was a key actor in a mounting insurgency uh, that materialized in Iraq during the summer of 2003. It was one that no one planned for. And Task Force 714 uh, and its leadership quickly realized uh, it was facing an enemy it had never thought of and um, could not dismantle through its existing ways of operating. So what, um, what 714 uh, uh, experienced was this, ugly surprise. Ugly surprise. So, um, it, and by ugly surprise, what I mean is that this organization uh, perfected to conduct surgical missions found itself facing a crisis in operational effectiveness. What I mean by that is that uh, it could not, in the way that it was organized, it could not operate or practice uh, effectively against this uh, secret Al-Qaeda underground. And McChrystal said, uh, we were losing to an enemy uh, that we should have dominated. So Task Force 714 faced ugly surprise. Um, by 2006 in Iraq, uh, the war in Iraq had led many to believe uh, in Washington and elsewhere that the war was lost. Um, I have it in that third bullet. Uh, significant acts of violence in Iraq had risen uh, in uh, summer of 2006 to 1,400 a, month, a week. Um, that was double what it was the year before, and, and it was growing. And Al-Qaeda dominated this insurgency. It seemed, this ins seemed like this insurgency was unstoppable. 
During this period, 2004 to 2006, um, the task force 714 was learning, uh, transforming itself uh, from a scalpel uh, to an industrial strength uh, counterterrorism machine. You'll see this if you read about the Iraq War and, uh, and um, read McChrystal's um, memoirs. You'll see that they talk about this task force as industrial strength. So what's it mean? You, what it means is this, that in 2004 in August, uh, operating at peak efficiency, Task Force 714 could carry out 18 raids a month. These are direct action raids by uh, 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 JSOC elements. In August of 2006, it could carry out 300 raids a month. So that's an immense change. So the question is, it's an increase of 15 times. So the question is, how they do it? And um, what I'm going to tell you is the story of transformation. Um, they were able to transform themselves to operate against uh, a, an enemy uh, that was different from any they had planned for. So Al-Qaeda in Iraq, it was a networked organization, and I'll explain more to you what that means in a moment. Um, and what 714 had to do was to be able to, to dismantle uh, its mid-level uh, commanders, uh, IED factory managers, financiers, facilitators of foreign fighters, that whole mid-level of their organization. Um, and they were able to do it. Now this runs counter to what many um, in security studies say about militaries at war. If you read the literature on, on this, you'll see that um, uh, there, the narrative is uh, that uh, militaries are not very good at adapting and learning in war. But this one did. So uh, how they do it? Um, how were they able uh, to overcome uh, barriers uh, to innovation? So that was the puzzle. That's, you know, social scientists always trying to explain puzzles. That was the puzzle, how they do it. And um, I... Um, I will argue that um, uh, they were able to do it because um, they, uh, they reflected uh, characteristic, what I call the characteristics of learning organizations. Now, I wanted to, um, I developed a model of uh, what, uh, what business and management uh, literature tells us about organizational learning. Um, I spent actually quite a long time reading in this literature uh, to, uh, to try to see what they were saying about organizational learning uh, in the age that we're living in. So we're living in a new age, right? We're in the age of uh, information, uh, complex organizations, and so on. And I wanted to, um, uh, to uh, figure out uh, what they uh, uh, identified as characteristics of learning and then see if um, I could see these characteristics in the 714 story. So that was kind of my method or approach. Um, what the Harvard Business Review tells us is that learning organization is skilled at creating, acquiring, and transferring knowledge and at modifying behavior to reflect this new knowledge. Um, and so, uh, I, as I said, I tried to identify uh, what, um, what they meant by that. And uh, my research question uh, came down to, uh, did Task Force 714 overcome a crisis in operational practice in Iraq 
because um, they, uh, they reflected these characteristics. So what are they? Let me just highlight them for you. Um, I've written on this, and um, uh, I'm happy to um, uh, tell you how to get uh, the, my things. They're all at my website, easy to get. But um, from, from uh, studying this business and management literature, and, and by the way, nowhere in it could, did I have the good luck of someone saying, these are the things that, that a learning organization has to reflect. So I had to try to deduce it from... From, uh, from the literature. So the first thing is that um, learning organizations are not paralyzed by surprise. And, uh, and what I mean by that is that they develop methods for responding to unexpected challenges that undermine their performance. Now, not all organizations have this, but learning organizations uh, this is a characteristic of them. Members learn methods that prepare them for the unexpected. So when surprise comes, uh, they manage it. Uh, they don't be, they're not paralyzed by it. So that's the first thing. Second thing is that in learning organizations today, problem solving uh, has to be a core competency for the organization as a whole. So in, in the old days, you know, when an organization faced a problem, um, they, they let it up to the boss to figure out uh, the solution to the problem. But learning organizations uh, institutionalize problem-solving methods to diagnose um, operational challenges, and problem-solving is a shared responsibility. Um, third characteristic is that in learning organizations, um, uh, their, their, their standard operating procedures, the way they do things, you know, what has worked is always challengeable. So organizational practices are challengeable. Fourth characteristic, knowledge collection uh, activates systematic learning. So learning organizations um, develop uh, systematic ways of collecting information uh, and then using that information to make the kind of changes that they need to improve performance. Learning organizations, leaders foster a culture of learning. What that means is that uh, leaders of learning organizations foster um, collective learning by empowering members through a per participatory approach that encourages uh, learning and problem solving. Uh, it's argued in, um, in the business world today that in today's complex world, leaders must foster initiative by subordinates at the operating level. And then the final characteristic uh, is um, uh, normally uh, in, um, in the business and management literature, learning is something that once you discover the changes you have to make, um, you turn them into operating procedures, and then you're good to go. But in today's complex world, um, you know, things that you learn and new procedures that you develop may only have a short shelf life. And so uh, learning, organizational memory captures and retains innovation, but not for long. So these are the things that um, uh, I uh, uh, deduced in building this model or characteristics of learning. And what I did was I took each of these characteristics and I developed um, uh, questions about each that were focused on different aspects of Task Force 714. And I had the good fortune of being able to um, do primary research with, um, with many of the 
uh, the key figures uh, in the task force. And here are three of them. So this is uh, McChrystal, and that's Admiral Mc, uh, McRaven, and that's the current CENTCOM commander, General Votel, uh, and, and a number of other people. So that, um, that's the, um, the, uh, the framework. Now, let me, um, let me take you back to Iraq in the fall of 2003. So in the fall of 2003, the uh, U.S. found itself in what I call the war after the war. In planning for OIF, you all know this, uh, little consideration was given to the likelihood that in the aftermath of in the uh, war, uh, there would be an insurgency, a war after the war. It wasn't imaginable. Um, but uh, due to escalating violence in the fall of 2003, Task Force 714 was given a mission of dismantling this secret Al-Qaeda organization, AQI. Um, the key to AQI's success, the reason that it was able to escalate this insurgency, was that it had a secret mechanism, a networked organization, that was spread out across uh, Iraq. So AQI's success was due to an extensive, decentralized, and networked organization composed of many uh, mid-level commanders and managers with authority to execute operations. Those commanders and managers, the mid-level of the organization, was their center of gravity. And, uh, and that, uh, or their strategic pressure point. And that is what um, Task Force 714 uh, had to be able to dismantle. Now, when it was given, as, uh, uh, given this mission, um, uh, it was a, an ugly surprise uh, for 714. Um, it, um, it, uh, it was not uh, ready for this kind of, uh, of mission. Uh, Al-Qaeda, as I say there, Al-Qaeda constituted a strategic surprise because it was unlike any insurgent organization that, um, uh, that they had thought about. I mean, it's not that they didn't know about networks, but AQI was a web of networks, and it didn't resemble any organizational pattern 714 had seen before. And, and certainly it was not a hierarchical organization. So it was new and different. Now, it's interesting that the initial response of 714 was to do more of the same, which is always um, uh, when organizations face a, a crisis in operational practice, whatever it is, whether it's what 714 did or it's a business, um, the immediate response is to double down. You know, we'll just do it more, better, faster, harder. Um, but 714 was operating at a, as a peacetime or, organization. It was built as a peacetime strategic scalpel. So a sea change was needed. McChrystal said we needed to view the mission differently. Uh, are we winning or losing against Al-Qaeda? Not just can we capture or kill them. Sure, they could capture and kill them. But they had to be able to uh, uh, degrade their networked organization. So by the fall of 2004, 714 understood it had to change. It was not paralyzed by surprise. Uh, it recognized that it had to learn and adapt to overcome an enemy uh, that it did not fully understand. So. Yeah, problem solving. So 714 
needed a new organizational mechanism for problem solving. And that mechanism was uh, this right here, a gyatif. So this is a very interesting quote here. Look at what McChrystal said. He said, 714 brought an industrial age force to an information age war. And what he meant by that was that Al-Qaeda in Iraq was a new problem set. And it necessitated a new approach to problem solving. 714 was a top-down military organization, traditional chain of command. Problem solving was a leader's responsibility. But problem solving had to become a shared responsibility for the entire organization. And this meant changing roles, rules, patterns of interaction, and the structure of the organization. Problem solving led to change, and for this to happen, 714 had to change organizationally. Now, this was a standalone organization used to operating in a semi autonomous way. 714 had to be redesigned and partnered with several US intelligence agencies to understand the unprecedented challenge it faced in Iraq. So it needed a new organizational mechanism to be able to unravel the 714 puzzle. And in that mechanism was a joint interagency task force. Now, what is this thing? Um, if you read about it, it they'll, they'll, you'll see it's called a whole-of-government approach to problem-solving. And the idea is that it brings different government agencies together to foster collaboration to overcome the tendency of government agencies to uh, seek autonomy rather than partnership. This really was, to call this a whole of government approach is a little bit of a misnomer. I would call it a whole of intelligence approach. And um, by that, I mean that in order to, uh, to operate against the Al-Qaeda uh, in Iraq network, Task Force 714 Needed, an inter, needed to take an interagency approach where it brought uh, uh, all the various intelligence agencies uh, into a task force that could support 714. So this was the idea of embracing a gyatif, the concept of, uh, for um, uh, dealing with the AQI problem. But the challenge was, how do you get intelligence agencies to make a commitment to support a task force in Iraq, a counterterrorism task force? So that was a big challenge for McChrystal, persuading each partner to take part in this. One of the ways that he was able to do it is that Task Force 714 was collecting an enormous amount of intelligence information on Al-Qaeda. When, when uh, they would conduct a raid, uh, they would uh, gather uh, and, uh, and take as part of the raid uh, all of the devices and uh, mechanisms that Al-Qaeda was using to communicate and to, to operate their network. So they had tremendous amount of information. They didn't know how to manage that information. But that information not did not just tell uh, the story of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, but its connection to a larger uh, regional and international network. 
So what McChrystal was able to do was to convince these intelligence agencies that there was something in it for them and that to be part of this task force meant having access to some of the most important uh, intelligence data about the war that we're in. So uh, this is how uh, he was able to bring these uh, intelligence agencies, which tend not to want to play well cooperatively, into a cooperative relationship. Access to intelligence and be part of the most important mission, the fight in Iraq. complexity. So the reason that he needed all of this intelligence support was uh, to uh, gain an understanding of the complex nature of AQI. And to understand that is not the easiest thing uh, to explain. So in the, um, in the, uh, the literature on, um, on, on management and, uh, and, uh, and change, organizational change, this issue of complex challenges has become uh, a central subject. Complex challenges mean that you face, um, uh, in this case, you face an organization that, uh, that looks something like this here. Now, this organization, uh, uh, gaining an understanding of this uh, is not an easy thing to do. And this organization uh, doesn't necessarily look like this in two months or three months. So, this, so complex challenges or complex organizations are ones in which the, the components of it uh, are uh, changing and, uh, and not, uh, not uh, a standard uh, uh, chain of command or organizational concept. So now Al-Qaeda in Iraq had several of these types of networks. So uh, what Task Force 714 had to be able to do was uh, learn about this network and then get inside it to find out who's who and, um, and uh, where the critical components of it were. Very difficult thing to do. So, and uh, this Al-Qaeda in Iraq had two sanctuaries that it could hide in. So traditionally, when we think about insurgencies, we say that they hide uh, in the population, population sanctuary. But this had another sanctuary, and that was the virtual sanctuary. And so this complex problem uh, is what 714 faced. Uh, now, uh, empowerment. So problem solving against these sorts of organizations, problem solving uh, has to advance adaptation uh, to meet complex challenges that are, di and that means that you need different leadership and management styles. So for 714, this meant that it had to shed a top-down approach to command, substitute problem solving from below. Operational decisions could not wait for senior leaders. Those closest to the fight offered the best opportunity to act decisively. And so um, empowerment was important. Um, the, the task force and the Jayadev had to empower and enable those at the operating level uh, to be able uh, to take initiative. So this was a really important 
aspect of the task force. Information and intelligence. So this was the targeting model that was used. And uh, in order for this to work effectively, uh, intelligence had to drive operations. And, um, and so what this means is that successful learning organizations uh, are able to identify uh, operational problems by developing the means to secure information uh, in an effective way. I would argue that for, the, for this um, uh, model to work, that Task Force 714 had to be able to have what I call intelligence dominance. It had to be able to uh, collect and manage uh, a tremendous amount of intelligence that uh, would allow it uh, to uh, make this uh, model uh, uh, operate um, quickly. So to increase operational tempo to dismantle Al-Qaeda's networks, the Jayadif had to be able to uh, fix on targets, watch those targets for, for uh, enough time to start to determine its pattern, raid those targets, capture individuals, collect all that intelligence, and be able to exploit it and analyze it. Now, to do that, 714 had to become, uh, had to go from uh, an organization in which 20% of its attention was intelligence and 80% operations to the opposite, 80% had to be intelligence. The person who really built this intelligence capability for 714 was Mike Flynn, General Mike Flynn. Um, many consider one of the smartest intelligence officers of his generation. He understood how, uh, how uh, uh, to build the intelligence architecture for the task force that allowed it uh, to, uh, to implement uh, this, uh, this targeting uh, system. So F3EAD, this is why, why they required interagency partnership. It had to have uh, all of these different intelligence agencies represented in its task force in order to manage the enormous amount of intelligence they were collecting. By being able to do that, they could start to see in a particular network who the critical individuals were. Now, McChrystal has this um, mantra that you all have heard, takes a network to defeat a network. What he, what he means by that is, that you have to be able to get inside an enemy's network and begin to identify uh, the critical uh, players in it. And the, the way that you are able to do that is by managing this enormous amount of intelligence. And it's very, um, you know, can't explain it in, uh, in, in, uh, in one presentation, but the intelligence architecture and, uh, and the, the changing role of collection and analysis uh, was critical to making uh, this process work. So once a target was identified, then the full gamut of intelligence capabilities of the interagency uh, could, uh, partners could track that target's pattern of life, its motives, mo its movements, communications, and associations within a network. So the, the intelligence community partners were important 
in what's called the fix phase. So you see those two platforms on the right. Um, the task force had access to platforms that would allow it to watch a particular individual or maybe a few individuals in real time uh, to determine their movements. It had the ability, once it was focused on that target, to collect SIGINT on that target, hear what they're doing, who they're communicating with. And it, it would start to build up a picture of this particular individual in this space and time. At some point, it would try to capture that person, bring them back, take what they've learned, and they would be able, they would put this, inf they would be able to, to take this information, computer, take everything out of it, put it into a fused database, cell phone, get all the information out of it. And this process allowed uh, the task force to get inside networks. Once you were inside those networks, then, then you could start to take out the critical nodes. And you do that as, as rapidly as possible. And through that process, um, uh, the, the capacity of, of uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, its capacity to operate started to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So, when you hear the, uh, the term, it takes a network to defeat a network, it means that you have an organization that can, uh, has the means for monitoring, monitoring in, 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 in inducting yourself inside of, and learning how it functions. Now, to do this uh, meant that there had to be uh, important change in leadership, uh, the way leaders operated. McChrystal uh, say, if you wait for me to make all these decisions, we're going to lose. So I won't go into uh, this uh, issue of leadership too much. I want to get actually to the results of 714. But um, look at this line right here. It says, in the complex environment of the current world, in the complex environment uh, of uh, 714's uh, AO in Iraq, leaders often will be called upon to act against their instinct. And, and what that means was that uh, authority had to be decentralized uh, to nurture initiative. And, uh, and, and, and it means, and, and McChrystal writes about this in Team and Teams, it means new rules of engagement. And, uh, and obstacles in the F3EA process that slowed the cycle down, the biggest obstacle was the traditional chain of command. So if you, if you um, want to uh, learn more about what uh, what he did, I recommend, his, really I recommend his memoir. I think his memoir is great on this. But specialists argue in today's complex, fast-changing world, leaders can no longer assume that only from the top can uh, crisis and operational performance be understood and resolved. And so a lot of what happened uh, in terms of the task force was empowering people and individuals down the chain of command uh, to be able to take initiative. And um, I mean, okay, so for you know individuals out of JSOC, that's you know you expect that. But for young intelligence analysts who came to this task force to be able to have that sense of of empowerment, to be able to to say in a uh, a briefing for operations, wait a minute, um, I know something that I learned from a piece of intelligence I was examining the other day that is going to, uh, that will impact what you're going to do. 
So change in, uh, in this was really important. And um, that meant uh, uh, the more, uh, problem solving uh, uh, had to be decentralized. Um, so how did it do? And how do we, we evaluate uh, such organizations? So I've got about, let me, what time do I have till Jessica? 45, okay. So let me talk a little bit about, about this. Uh, what's, uh, what's success? Um, I would, uh, I would argue that, first of all, you, you have to understand uh, 714 within the context of the larger strategy that was taking place in Iraq at this time. So um, the, the, numbers, uh, the numbers tell us a lot. Uh, acts of violence, uh, fall of 2014, 1,400 a week. 2007, 1,600 a week. 2009, 200 a week. Uh, 2010, 169 a week. So a key to this change, I would argue, um, was counterinsurgency strategy, supported by surge, Sunni awakening, established stability. But you also needed to um, degrade that secret Al-Qaeda network, that secret Al-Qaeda infrastructure. And dismantling that was the mission of 714. Now, by adopting the characteristics that I outlined, 714 was able to raise its operational tempo from 18 raids to 300 raids. That's 15 times. It did not become 15 times bigger in terms of its operational units. But it was able to do that. Now, how effective were those operations? Well, the linchpin to degrading AQI's operational tempo was eliminating uh, mid-level commanders and managers, those who made the network function. McChrystal called this the guts of the network. Against those targets, uh, Task Force 714 focused. Now the next slide gives you a snapshot of what uh, Al Qaeda or what um, 714 accomplished in um, in one month in 2007. Now, wh who are these guys? What is this? So, this uh, these were um, these were 45 individuals that were either captured or killed. Um, who were they? Mid-level managers and commanders. Um, you have in there uh, six city-level emirs for AQI. Six geographical functional cell leaders, operational cells. Fourteen uh, foreign uh, terrorist facilitators, three managers of car bomb factories, six logistical support managers, and eight media propaganda operators, operatives. So that's sort of a snapshot one month. What 714 had to be able to do was do that every month month in and month out for three years in order to, to weaken uh, and start to break down this networked organization. What are indicators of success? 
Um, because uh, of the focus on capture, uh, 714 every night was picking up members of this organization. And, and they, were, they had a very effective interrogation capability that um, was based on one principle. And that principle was that you wanted the person that you were interrogating to believe that you knew him better than he knew himself. And by being able, being able to do that, they could start to develop a narrative of, from these detainees about what was happening inside the organization. And, uh, and what, what they learned was as 2007 rolled into 2008, that in, and, and then into 2009, that intelligence from interrogations of those captured pointed to a major decline in the capacity of different parts of Al-Qaeda's network to execute operations. 714 was driving down their capacity. And they learned that from the interrogation. They also learned it from SIGINT. Because the way these, uh, the, the, this network communicated was the way you all communicate. But that was available through very sophisticated SIGINT capabilities that the task force had access to. Additionally, there was the, uh, just the, the numbers that were being taken off the battlefield. So by the end of 2009, uh, 714 uh, had uh, had reduced al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, to the point where uh, it, uh, its operational tempo was a shadow of, uh, of, of what it had been at the height of the insurgency. Now, the, the question that I'm always asked is, um, uh, what's it all mean? What's it all mean? And uh, what did it really accomplish? And um, uh, you know who that is. It's General Odierno. General Odierno said that winning in such wars uh, means that um, you're able to reduce the enemy's organization or its network, networks to what he calls the irreducible minimum. You can't take it down any further. Um, you, you get it to the point where uh, it, uh, it's seriously weakened. It may retain minimal capability. And you've got to keep it there. You've got to keep it there. Um, you win at the operational level. Now, for 714... And I would argue for um, uh, U.S. Uh, counterinsurgency strategy in Iraq in this period, 2007, 8, 9, uh, that it reached this irreducible minimum. That doesn't mean that the war's over. What that means is that you have set the conditions for what I call the post-conflict post transition. Effective counterinsurgency and counterterrorism is necessary part of the resolution of Iraq-type wars. It'll never be sufficient. COIN and CT set conditions for post-conflict political reconciliation, development, and reconstruction. Um, They set the conditions. So this uh, was a critical period this, of post-conflict transition. Um, this is a story, sad story here. Sad story. Because uh, at the operational level, 714 took al-Qaeda in Iraq to the irreducible minimum. 
Um, but uh, winning in these wars means winning the post-conflict phase. And, uh, and that uh, is the subject for another talk. So um, I know I threw a lot at you. It's complicated. So is war today. Um, I think 714 is a very interesting organization to look at uh, things they did. Um, I had the good fortune to write about it. Um, I had help uh, from those who were part of it. Um, I recommend, um, uh, uh, I, uh, as I said, you can read things I've written about it. Um, I also uh, recommend um, McChrystal's uh, uh, memoir and uh, his team of teams. So questions or observations, anything you uh, want to ask me? Potted plants. Now, here, here we go. Um, I think these are principles that uh, any organization that's facing today's world needs to, to, to think about and study and embrace. It's not just for, for military organizations. And where I learned them was in, in the business world and in the management world. Because, see, you, you know, for all of you or for, for our military, um, the new, war, the new age began after 9-11. For the business world, the new age began in the 90s. The impact of information, globalization, uh, decentralization, really changed um, how they thought about management and how to manage uh, their enterprises. So I would argue that that uh, any organization, and certainly military organization, um, has to, um, has to uh, embed within it uh, uh, concepts of learning and adapting. Um, I, I, you know, I, I always like to point out that um, the Marine Corps, every Marine officer um, has to read uh, reads one book. Every one of them reads one book. It's called First to Fight by Victor Krulak. And what he says to Marines is, uh, you're going to go first. You're not going to know the context that you're in. And you better be ready to learn and adapt. And you would be surprised at how much that's emphasized in the basic school uh, for, the, for the Marine Corps. So um, I would say that that we have to uh, study learning, how organizations learn, how, how to use information. Um, information for Task Force 714, information intelligence went through a revolution. Just imagine how much information was being collected just through imagery, real-time imagery. You saw that, um, that platform with, we, we now have platforms that can video 60 different targets in a city real time, 24 seven. Who's gonna watch all of that? Who's gonna watch it? No one. Uh, you're going to have artificial intelligence capabilities to watch that, to, to start to identify things in it that intelligence analysts are gonna, gonna work with. So we gotta learn about all of this, all of it. You know, I, I'm, do, I'm working on a book, um, uh, The Evolution of Intelligence. Um, how, do, how does collection, analysis, and operations change when you go from uh, peacetime to wartime, wartime, irregular wartime, irregular enemy, armed group, networked. It, it has an amazing impact on, on, on the intelligence disciplines. 
changes how you think about imagery, changes how you think about signals, human analysis. So, um, yeah, uh, we've got to, you got to be, I, I think in today's military, in today's world, you got to be learning all the time. Can't stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time with us today, speaking on this topic. Um, I think we have slides. Can advertise for MWR real quick. Okay. So next uh, event will be the Athena Rising panel on the first of May in Eiffel.